Hello, I'm Vicky Paris. I'm a consultant in infectious diseases, and I'm going to talk to you about an approach to empirical antimicrobials. Um, so I'm going to talk about a structure that you can use every time you see a patient to think about um, why am I giving this empirical antimicrobial? And secondly, is this a patient that might need something different or something in addition to the, to the usual empirical treatment? So why do we have antimicrobial guidelines? Every trust will have them, um, and usually they're, they're now electronic, so they're easy to access. Well, the firstly, they're evidence-based, um, and secondly, they're based um, upon local resistance patterns. Um, they're also based upon drug availability. So if there's a national shortage of an antibiotic, usually the antimicrobial steward um, uh, committee would meet and they would decide an alternative, they would update the protocols, um, and so you, you, would, you would not be prescribing an antibiotic where there's a shortage. And finally, they're useful for antimicrobial stewardship. So I'm not going to talk very much about stewardship, but you may have heard of the campaign Start Smart and then Focus, um, and this is a, a, a structure to give an empirical antimicrobial and then review it within 48 hours to focus, to narrow the spectrum of what you're given to prevent antibiotic resistance. But altogether, this means that antimicrobial guidelines, they make your life easier. Um, but it's really important that you know why you are prescribing what, you are, what you've chosen to prescribe, and also to know when you need to modify your prescription. So you're seeing your patient and you suspect they have an infection. This might be admitting someone in the front door, doing a bit of ward cover, or just on your normal ward rounds in the daytime. So I think there are four main questions that'll help you to, um, to kind of make sure that you're giving your patient the best care. The first is thinking, what am I trying to cover? The second is, have they had any treatment so far? The third is, could they have a resistant organism? And the fourth is, is there any previous microbiology results to guide me? Starting with the first question, what am I trying to cover? Well, the first thing is you need to think about the source. So you, that will be done through your clinical assessment and your investigations. And I really would stress the importance that sending the right tests at the beginning before any antibiotics, preferably, will help you um, in later. So at the 48 hours that you need to review your antimicrobials and then you know, you're aiming to narrow the spectrum, um, it will really have helped you if you sent you know, the, the urine test to begin with before antibiotics um, or you know, other tests that will help you out. Once you've identified your source, be it urine, chest, skin, soft tissue, I would urge you to think again about the source. So think about hidden sources. So tonsillitis is a classic one because someone comes in with you no know, fever and a headache um, and you think you might be end up LPing them, but look in their mouth, maybe they've got a tonsillitis. Um, check a patient all over, that includes rolling the patient, check all the way over their skin. A classic to miss is um, HSV lesions on the buttock or the genitals, maybe again, um, someone who comes in with fever um, or someone who has um, encephalitis. And also, if someone has a bandage on them at any place or a dressing on their leg, then you need to look under that because you never know what's under a dressing. It might be something just very shallow and fine with no cellulitis, but it might be something horrible and gangrenous. And if you miss that, then you've definitely missed your source. And then once you've thought again about your source, I would encourage you to think a third time about your source. And this time think about, is there any prosthetic material? So this could be um, a long line, such as a Hickman line, or maybe a Tessio line in dialysis patients. If they have a graft, have they had a, a recent aortic graft or a previous aortic graft? Do they have any metal implants um, you know, in their joints? Do they have a, um, a VP shunt? Um, do they have a cardiac device, such as a pacemaker or a prosthetic valve? So knowing whether they have any prosthetic material is important because that may change the antibiotics that you want to um, give them. The next thing when you're thinking about what am I trying to cover is thinking about what particular type of organism um, that you have, that you might be dealing with. So the majority of infections that we see are bacterial, but also we see viral, fungal, and parasitic. And then if you think, oh, I'm dealing with a bacterial infection, 
I would encourage you to think about what type of bacteria it is. Is it a gram positive? Is it a gram negative? Is it an atypical or is it an anaerobe? Because think, thinking about where the source is and thinking about the likely um, organisms and thinking about whether it's gram positive or gram negative really helps you to understand why you're giving this empirical antimicro antibiotic and also thinking about whether you need to change something. So for example, if you think you've identified um, a gram positive infection, so for example, a community acquired um, pneumonia um, or a skin and soft tissue infection. It would be really important in a skin and soft tissue infection to think about whether they might have MRSA um, uh, or um, if they have um, a line in or another prosthetic device, thinking about whether they could have a coagulase negative staph because these, you, these situations usually won't be covered by your empirical anti antibiotic from your guideline. They're a special circumstance where you need to give an additional coverage. So for example, um, MRSA, you'd be thinking giving a glycopeptide such as vancomycin or ticoplanin, usually in addition to the antibiotic you're already given. And if you were worried about a line infection, again, giving a glycopeptide um, to cover that. If you have a gram negative infection, there are some specifics as well that you need to think about. So think about, do I have, um, might there be a pseudomonas? because again, this might be something that isn't covered by um, the empirical antibiotic in your guideline. And you might think that you need to give an additional or different antibiotic. And I think these are, good, are four good antibiotics to um, remember that cover pseudomonas. So ciprofloxacin, gentamicin, tazacin, and meropenem. They're, four, they're a list of four antibiotics that's quite useful to remember and in case you think, is this a pseudomonal infection, I need to cover it. Also, gram negatives, there's increasing number of res resistant organisms. So you need to consider whether you've got one of these on your hand. For example, an extended spectrum beta lactamase producer, an ESBL. And again, this may need a different um, antibiotic to be, um, to be given. Different hospitals will have different approaches, so check your trust guidelines. Um, but carbapenems will cover ESBLs, although we are for antimicrobial stewardship, we try to limit the number of carbapenems that we use. For atypicals, these organisms are such as Legionella, Mycoplasma and Chlamydia. Um, and the treatment for these includes macrolides, tetracyclines and quinolones. And this is why community um, acquired uh, pneumonia guidelines might include, might be such as amoxicillin and clarithromycin. So you're giving the clarithromycin to cover um, an atypical if you're worried about it until you've ruled it out, such as sending um, urinary antigens for Legionella. And then anaerobes. Again, often you don't get a purely anaerobic infection. Often you can get mixed infections. Um, and often some the antibiotics that we give, uh, which are broad spectrum, um, for a gram-negative infection would cover anaerobes as well. Um, but metronidazole is com commonly associated with covering anaerobes, um, but also comoxiclav, tazacin, and car um, uh, carbapenems. So you might not have to think too specifically about additional coverage for um, anaerobes if you think it might be a mixed infection. So the second question is, have they had any treatment so far? And you want to know what they have had. So um, with electronic records, that's easier to know if they've um, had prescriptions from urgent care centres or GPs, um, and then for how long? So if they received the prescription, have they actually taken the antibiotic? Um, you know, have they just taken 24 hours of it? Um, or have they taken already five days or three courses over the past six weeks? Um, because this information will help you decide the treatment that they've had before. Has it been the wrong choice, either because it's covering the wrong organism, the wrong source, or might there be resistance, which makes it the wrong choice? Sometimes it might be because they've not had long enough, so they got started on antibiotics by their GP for a presumed urinary tract infection, but they've only had kind of one dose and they've become worse, they've come into hospital. It might not necessarily be that they're being prescribed the wrong antibiotic, just that it's not had enough time to work as of yet. Also, it gives you the chance to think, is there something else going on? Maybe this isn't infection, maybe it's something else that's going on, an alternative diagnosis. 
And also knowing if they had any treatment is important because of the impact on microbiology tests. If you're lucky, maybe a test has already been sent before they've reached you in hospital. Maybe the GP has sent you um, a urine um, sample um, so that actually you can just look up on the system and know that they're already on the right antibiotic or you need to change their antibiotics based on the sensitivities available. But also knowing if someone has had antibiotics before you take a urine sample is important because then you, you might expect there will be no growth in the, in the urine sample even if that actually is a urinary tract infection, if they've already had kind of a, a day or so of antibiotics. The third question, could they have a resistant organism? Well, there's several things to think about here. Are they known to be colonized? Are they already known to have had previous MRA, uh, MRSA screen? Have they been traveling? Um, so some countries have different resistance patterns. Take, for example, um, strep pneumo. Um, have high resistance in you know, other parts of the world. Um, and so um, for a strep pneumo meningitis, for example, um, you might want to give additional antibiotics. So on our trust guideline, it actually says if you look, um, if the patient has been traveling recently to these countries, um, add in to keftaraxone the addition of vancomycin in case of penicillin resistance. Have they been in other hospitals, either abroad or in the UK? And this is related to um, multi-resistant organisms, particularly thinking about um, carbapenem maize producing organisms. Um, and that's why often if patients are transferred from a healthcare facility, we'll put them in a side room um, and then do a, a, a screen um, before kind of de-isolating them. And knowing if they're colonized with, with um, a multi-resistant organism, um, it doesn't matter if they're just colonized from you know, their own being sick, it matters from an infection, point, infection control point of view. But if they be then subsequently become unwell, you have to think, is it their resistant organism they're colonized with that is the cause of the infection or is that just a bystander in this? Do I need to cover it or don't I need to cover it? And then finally, think about nosocomial um, risk factors for having resistance. So just because someone came into hospital um, without being colonized with the resistant organism doesn't mean they're not now um, colonized, even if we've tried to do our best with infection prevention control. And then finally, the fourth question is, are there any previous microbiology results to guide me? Now, this is really important. And I think this you know, is an often missed area when you're, particularly when you're clerking someone, um, just have a quick look um, on their previous microbiology results because it might really help you. Um, so I think important things not to miss if someone has a skin and soft tissue infection, don't miss the fact that you know already know they're colonized with MRSA, because um, if, if you don't think about it, your empirical antibiotics won't cover it. If you know they're MRSA positive, you'll need to give additional coverage to cover that. Um, for urine, um, it's important to look back at results. That may be just simply because you know they have recurrent urinary tract infections. And if you look back at every time, um, then nitrofurantoin resistance and your antimicrobial guidelines um, say the empirical treatment for an uncomplicated lower, lower urine tract infection is nitrofurantoin, well then don't give it because you, the likelihood is they're going to be resistant to it again. And um, also look back at urines to identify um, previous ESBLs and also VREs, vancomycin resistant enterococci. So these are kind of more drug resistant um, varieties. For chest, it's important to know whether someone is colonized with pseudomonas, if they have bronchiectasis or they're a cystic fibrosis patient, to just have a look back at their previous sputum results. Um, and if they um, are colonized, these are the types of patients that you might think that you need to broaden your spectrum to cover pseudomonas. So we've chosen our antibiotic. We've thought about why we're giving the empirical treatment. We've thought about, is there, is there a special circumstance that makes me want to kind of modify what I'm giving or add an additional coverage. And then there are some other prescribing um, considerations. Think about allergies, think about absorption, whether the, you know, the patient will absorb it if you give it orally, whether they need it intravenously. Think about renal function, because a lot of antibiotics need to, the dose needs to be altered um, if um, the, there is renal dysfunction. Think about drug-drug interactions, the classic one is clarithromycin and statins. We usually hold the statins while people um, are on those. Um, but there are many, many others just to have a little think about. Um, 
Think about the dosing. Some antibiotics are weight-based and sometimes you'll need to do um, ideal body weight, not actual body weight. Um, and think about therapeutic drug monitoring. So um, some drugs such as amikacin might, uh, might need uh, therapeutic drug monitoring to check the levels, check they're not toxic. For all these, look at your antimicrobial um, guidelines because these situations will be covered in there. And finally, the really important thing is to think about source control. It's brilliant that you've selected your right antibiotic, you've thought about whether you need to give something additional, but with the best one in the world, sometimes antibiotics alone aren't enough to control an infection. If there's um, a, you know, an abscess um, that's, that's sitting there or another hidden um, source that you've not controlled, um, then you need to think about whether you can drain that to gain control of the infection. So to summarize, the key points are to use your local empirical antimicrobial guidelines, but you need to think about why you're giving it, and you need to think about whether you have a special situation, which means you need to modify it. And with, by using these four questions, um, I think you can, um, you can do that. So the first is, what am I trying to cover? The second is, have they had any treatments so far? The third is, could they have a resistant organism? And the fourth, are there any previous microbiology results to guide me? Thank you.